Hey, good afternoon to everyone. Sorry for the disturbance. And good afternoon to everyone. And uh, due to some technical issue, we are not able to start the lecture on time. So today the lecture will be delivered by Dr. S. Ramachandran from CSIR IGIB. And uh, he will deliver the lecture on text mining from biomedical literature. Hello. Hello. Okay. 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 So good e good afternoon, friends. Uh, I am uh, uh, going to speak on the topic of uh, text mining from biomedical literature in the drug discovery hackathon uh, training program. And in this, uh, uh, through this uh, talk, what I will do is I will introduce you to some uh, processes and uh, methods, approaches, which might help you to uh, help you in your uh, drug discovery uh, work in the COVID uh, topic. So I will uh, run through this uh, talk on a different disease, which is uh, vitiligo as a sample. And uh, from there, you can learn the methods and approaches uh, through uh, the, they are available in the internet and on the web. So you will be able to use them on their own and uh, you can uh, apply them to the current uh, disease, which is uh, COVID-19. So my name is Ramachandran and I am from CSAR IGIB. So what does uh, text mining process involve? The text mining process involves uh, the following steps. Information retrieval from any source and in this case uh, we will uh, stick to uh, NCBI uh, papers published from NCBI PubMed and uh, PubMed Central and uh, but in general information retrieval means information from anywhere including newspapers including uh, other uh, internet uh, sites, authentic internet uh, internet sites such as uh, association for a given disease, uh, doctors, experts and so on and so forth. That is the collective approach of information retrieval. Uh, but in this case, we will stick to the PubMed uh, uh, repository from the NCBI. Then uh, next comes is document classification, which means uh, how to classify the documents into different categories. So this is very important because this helps uh, one to actually uh, look at the corpus in detail and uh, uh, try to prioritize those uh, articles and those research uh, areas which are uh, most important for a given particular uh, you know, study. The next is summarization, which means that you want to classify and then you want to uh, make a summary of all the uh, findings uh, present in the articles. So that will give in summary a short overview of uh, what research has been carried out and uh, what uh, uh, are the main uh, important uh, details that uh, people would like to know. The next step is named entity recognition and normalization. So this is actually a very important part of text mining. So named entity recognition means that uh, it is a process by which the different entities otherwise called nouns in the English grammar, they are recognized and they are then categorized under different categories based on a prior knowledge of where the categories belong. So in this, uh, uh, in our case, it will be like genes, diseases, 
chemical compounds and so on. So the chemical compounds will come under the category of chemicals. The diseases will come under the category of diseases and the genes will come under the category of genes. And uh, the process of normalization is that the same compound may be known by different names, but essentially it is the same compound. So it may have a common name, it may have an IOPSC name, then it will have a smile string and it will also have other uh, 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 inchy formats and so on and so forth. So the process of normalization means that we are referring to the same compound by different names. So different authors might have used uh, different names, but they are basically referring to the same compound. So this is called normalization. And in the same, case, same way for genes, sometimes there are different symbols. Sometimes authors refer to genes by their names and sometimes by their official gene symbol, which is recommended by nomenclature committee. So it is important to remember that the nomenclature committee, like IUPSC nomenclature committee, biochemistry nomenclature committee, genes nomenclature committee, their job is to provide a standard symbol or a standard formula notation for a given particular entity. So this we must all follow. But in the literature, sometimes because of the general uh, practice, sometimes this is, uh, uh, you know, like this. So for example, uh, many people are called by their nicknames. And they may even be more popular by their nickname than their actual official name. And if uh, suddenly a committee says that, no, no, you must only call by official name and not use nickname. But even though people may try, but sometimes what happens is because of the habit, because of the awareness, the uh, nickname or other name becomes uh, uh, becomes used in the literature as well in communication and uh, therefore we require to normalize this to the same entity so that is called normalization then comes the relationship between the entities so all this has to be done by computer imagine all these steps what I am showing you has to be done by computer through algorithms. Okay, so humanly it is possible to do for a few sets of articles or papers. But if you have more than 10,000 articles or even 5,000 articles, then it becomes difficult. You need a big team to do it in a reasonable time. So therefore, we use computers for this processes. Relationship between entities is uh, the way the authors have described how the two entities are connected to each other. So relationship essentially means connection. So if in a network uh, view, entities will be like boxes and then boxes are connected through lines and these lines are called connections which are basically relationships. Then there is a linguistic structure into which today we won't go into and uh, then there is what is called data visualization, the examples of which I will show in uh, the presentation uh, today in the following slides. So the first is the information retrieval. And for information retrieval, we normally mostly go to National Library of Medicine and they have uh, made this PubMed interface, which basically allows us to search all the articles which are, uh, <coughs> which are entered into the PubMed database and almost all the articles, scientific articles which are published they are all entered into the PubMed uh, database. 
so mm. that everybody gets an uh, equal access to all the articles that are published and uh, worldwide and uh, they have provided a short uh, search interface which uh, uh, this is basically the basic interface that i am showing in which i am just putting the word vitiligo this is the example i am taking today for the vitiligo disease and the lessons we learn from this example will be applicable more or less equally to other diseases also some specific details will be different no doubt because every disease has its own characteristic feature but broadly the main steps will be mostly common so that is why i am taking this example and showing so now you can see that At the moment we type vitiligo and uh, press the search, then seven thousand seven hundred and sixty-nine results we are getting, meaning that there are seven thousand seven hundred and sixty-nine articles. And the very first one is a Lancet paper that is coming up uh, with the authors Ezidin, Witten, and so on. so this you can then sort it based on the date and based on different uh, parameters we can do this and we can save all these abstracts into a text file and save it into our computer then we use a package in r called pubmed dot minor which actually can read these abstracts and format them into the r based structure s for structure which then allows us to carry out systematic data extraction and pattern extraction and understand the disease and the kind of uh, therapeutic approaches people are taking towards it so in the next slide i show how the classification can be done so for example here i have taken first is we want to know about pathogenesis in the disease so the pathogenesis in the disease for instance uh, here we have taken vitiligo pathogenesis and uh, after searching through the entire set of 7000 uh, abstracts we get about 10% of abstracts which are describing the pathogenesis of the disease then we go to treatment of course this is one of the main focus of any disease that we want to see how we can give treatment for the patient for the patients to overcome and get cured of the disease so you can see that there is um, three times more abstracts compared to pathogenesis in the category of treatment this means that there is a big focus towards treatment of this disease compared to pathogenesis now there is one another uh, area of vitiligo which is uh, psychology aspect of the disease so psychology aspect is an important aspect in any disease in any disease psychological side is an important side to be aware of many times we ignore this due to which we are not able to get the full picture of the disease and how to tackle the disease we are not able to get the full picture if we ignore the psychology part so psychology is a very inherent part of human disease however when we search using the term psychology then we see only 18 abstracts which is like uh, 1% 
slightly more than 1% or 2% of the entire corpus of vitiligo. So, it is not only in our case, it is the same worldwide that there are very few people working on psychology of a given disease. Let us look at these different uh, classified uh, uh, abstracts from this disease vitiligo. Then the next step is the drugs, because that is also very important, which can be used for treating patients with this disease. However, we see that only uh, very few, uh, again, abstracts are devoted to drugs. So the reason, of course, I can say because I studied about it, so I can say, but I will not say right now. I will say uh, after a few more slides so that you also feel and go through the same flow as the slides. So we will see why there are so few abstracts in drugs, but a lot of abstracts in treatment and uh, some abstracts in pathogenesis as well. So this classification immediately gives us a view of how the disease research has been progressing and how it has been studied. From here, students can immediately map which areas would require more focus and therefore more discoveries or more insights into the disease can be obtained through this uh, rather simple way of classification process. There are many other terms we can include in classification. I have shown these uh, four terms here uh, within this limited time today, but you can uh, you can imagine and include more topics as well. So the next topic is summarization. So we have classified into different categories. Now we want to summarize them. What is all there in each categories? So let's look at the psychological case. So in the psychology case, we can see that a range of psychological outcomes are common in people with vitiligo. The prevalence of anxiety was influenced by type of screening tools suggesting the need for validation of psychological outcome screening tools in the field of dermatology. So this means that to study the psychological aspects of the disease, some validation of the screening tools are required in the field of dermatology in general and in vitiligo in particular. So this happens to be an important summary that we can get from the psychological uh, classified part of the corpus. The next that we can get summary is, again in terms of psychology, is that it says that the findings of this study present a unique in-depth analysis of British South Indians living with vitiligo and suggest there is a need for further research to explore cultural associations of disfigurement and of adjustment to chronic skin conditions. So, the psychological aspects of a disease goes far beyond from the patient into culture and community level also. Then their study also says that they suggest in addition to individual therapeutic intervention, there may be a need for community intervention in dispelling myths and raising awareness of sources of support and treatment. So you can imagine that this opens up a new area for people to look at how to make a community intervention for this uh, disease, in the case of this disease, 
and also to dispel the myths that whether some treatment can be done or not with respect to this disease. There is also another aspect where patients could benefit from cognitive behavioral therapy in coping and living with vitiligo. So once they have got this disease, then how they can be given cognitive, cognitive or behavioral therapy, that is another new area which people can try to look into when they look at the psychology aspects of the disease vitiligo. I heard in the news that some people who have got COVID, they are even committing suicide. This has come in the news somewhere, I heard. So this is also an aspect that Psychology is a very important feature and an aspect that has to be looked into in each and every disease. It is not only pathogenesis and it is not only treatment that we are looking at. Then there is also this summary that preliminary evidence suggests that psychological therapy may have a positive effect on the progression of the condition itself. See, even psychological therapy is now trying, there is a, evidence is slowly trying to come that they are helping in the uh, positive way on the progression of the vitiligo condition. So, psychological aspect of a disease cannot be ignored even though you can see uh, in front of you the numbers from the numbers that many people are not working on the psychological aspects of the disease. So this is uh, one uh, summary that we can get from this corpus of classification. Of course, I'm not showing the full summary. This is only a part summary, but it is being shown as a way of example of how psychological counseling into patient care and management are being discussed and how that can help in tackling and uh, coping and living with the disease vitiligo. Now, <clears throat> let us come to the pathogenesis. So, in the case of pathogenesis, some summaries are very useful, such as uh, the pathophysiology um, it uh, basically now many people are trying to obtain different kinds of inhibitors like for example jack inhibitors is mentioned here then uh, there is an autoimmune hypothesis which is most cited for this vitiligo disease there is a dysfunction in metabolic pathways which could lead to production of toxic metabolites causing damage to metal melanocytes the melanocytes are important cells uh, with important functions due to uh, which are getting disrupted. That is due to which why people are getting vitiligo. And uh, the discussion of vitiligo summarizes varied clinical presentation of the disease. That is the different uh, uh, <coughs> different. Uh, clinical presentation and their varieties. We will go into that in detail very soon. We will be able to see all these through algorithms uh, and uh, we will be able to obtain insights into the disease, into this disease through these methods. That is, to, that is the level to which the text mining uh, algorithms have been developed uh, by different groups. Then uh, there is also a new uh, concept is emerging, which is uh, the pathogenesis interlinked to pigment homeostasis and due to which the perspectives might change. Then there is a relationship between vitiligo and skin cancer as well and the immunotherapies and so on, which requires close monitoring. This is again as to say that this is uh, short example of the summary of the vitiligo pathogenesis 
and not the full summary, uh, which I cannot present here, because that itself will take one full uh, class. So this is an example of how you can obtain insights into the pathogenesis of the disease. <coughs> Excuse me. Then the next comes with regard to treatment. So with respect to treatment, what are the summaries we can get? So we can get an initial summaries, for example, in terms of how to achieve a satisfactory and often stable repigmentation. Because vitiligo is a loss of pigment. So if you get back the pigment, then vitiligo disappears. So the problem is the loss of pigment is in some places in the body and not everywhere. Due to which what happens is some parts are having pigment and other parts are not having pigment. So that gives a very uh, different appearance from normal appearance and due to which the disease has different types of clinical presentations. The, some of the items on which treatments are being worked upon include corticosteroids, calcineurin inhibitors, phototherapy, photochemotherapy, then antioxidants, and even Chinese medicine are, are, uh, are being studied and investigated with respect to the treatments that are possible for the given disease. So by obtaining a quick summary of the category of treatment category, classified category of the disease, we can obtain essentially the most important, the important areas of work that is being carried out in the case of a given disease. Now comes the next uh, aspect, which is in the process of text mining, which is called named entity recognition. So for this, there is a utility we have. Uh, I mean, we have means it is developed by NCBI, some people at NCBI called PubTater. So PubTater actually is a short form of PubMed annotator which means recognizing the entities. And the PubTater program is a multi-program, meaning that it runs using artificial intelligence and machine learning. And uh, it is through that it is able to recognize the different named entities and then classify them into different categories based on what those entities are. So that is what is called named entity recognition. So Puptator one can use uh, on their website and obtain the uh, colorful representation of the entities and uh, know what are those entities and uh, where they are located in the text and what their importance are. So in the case of PubMed Minor, because we have many, many papers, like thousands of papers, we cannot go to the website and do the process one by one. So we can do it for a few papers, but doing for thousands of papers becomes a little bit of a hurdle. So therefore in PubMed Minor, package, there is a connector to the PubTata function and that connector, what it does is it identifies the genes, the diseases and various other entities that are identified by the PubTata and then it classifies them into the different categories based on PubTata data and an Excel file can be generated. So this is shown here is an example of that Excel file where we can see all the genes that are involved or worked upon 
in the disease vitiligo. Again, show, being shown here is a snapshot of the entire genes that are present in the corpus uh, by way of example. And what we can see here is the disease that is vitiligo itself is a gene. There's a gene called vitiligo. Then there are genes called SCNP1, interleukin-2, then zinc alpha-2 glycoprotein, IL-10, IL-19, catalase gene, and so on. Now, beside each gene, there is a number also associated. What is this number? This number is the gene ID number given by the NCBI. So, using this gene ID number, we will be able to do the normalization. Because a gene which is known as CAT and a gene which is known as catalase, they are both having same ID. See, they are both having same IDs. This means that these two are not different genes. They are the same gene with the same ID. So this is called the process of normalization. And given these genes and gene IDs, you can write a small program in the Excel macro or in the R in order to carry out this normalization process and obtain the set of genes that are known by different names, but it is the same gene. Then we also see tyrosinase as one of the genes with its given gene ID. Yeah. One more example here is the diseases case where we see that the diseases are also recognized and classified under the category of diseases as we can see here. So autoimmune diseases are there, then retinoblastoma is there, chronic uh, depigmenting disorder of the skin is there and so on. So each of these disease names are recognized by Pupteta. And then beside that, we can see what is called a mesh ID. So like for gene, you have gene ID. Similarly, for diseases, we have what is called mesh ID. So mesh ID means it mesh is short for medical subject headings. And it is also uh, uh, ID and a, uh, a nomenclature system developed by the NCBI and its purpose is also to do this normal normalization. So it is recognized at uh, different uh, uh, abstracts. So each line is, uh, is the list of diseases in each abstract. And uh, that is then over, uh, uh, read through an Excel file. Next, we now want to ask the question, how these entities are connected, how they are related to each other. So we run what is called a co-occurrence function where in, in PubMed minor, which actually helps us to uh, <laughs> extract the sentences where both the entities are connected. So, for example, here in this sentence, we can see that IL-22 may provoke inflammation. So, inflammation is an entity recognized by uh, pub data. And uh, uh, IL-22 is an entity, so which leads to the destruction of melanocytes. So we can also see that here CXCL10 is an entity, which is a gene. It's actually a chemokine. And its expression reflects subtle inflammation, which is an entity in normal appearing skin, but not in stable, depigmented lesions, supporting the hypothesis that 
melanocytes themselves initiate autoimmune inflammation prior to uh, sorry um, prior to clinically uh, uh, clinical presentation of the evidence of the disease so <clears throat> the same melanocyte which is uh, uh, helping to produce pigment is now turning into uh, non pigmenting autoimmune uh, effects which is actually uh, uh, causing the vitiligo so in this way through step by step we are able to see the how the entities are being connected so entity connections are very specific they are very specific for individual biological process in the disease process so any entity will not be connected to any other entity without a reason or without an evidence so that is what is described in each of the papers so next comes what is called visualization so in the case of visualization what we want to do is we want to really look at the data and try to understand what they mean so for instance if we take the corpus of vitiligo psychology then what we see is that 50 terms or words that appear in this corpus so you can see obviously vitiligo it comes as the top uh, term because that is where from where these uh, abstracts are coming so that will definitely be there then the word psychology is also coming but along with that patience is also coming psychological is coming so so related see these are more or less synonyms only then there are other words such as research quality hospital depressive and so on so depressive seems to be uh new uh, word and then anxiety as we saw that is also there but it is smaller in size then there is this word which is called alexithymia alexithymia and then there are uh, we know depression we know anxiety these because these are common words alexithymia is not a common word so if you search for alexithymia then it says that it is a particular case of uh, you know how people descri- cannot describe their emotions there is some problem in describing the emotions so somehow that is all also connected with the disease vitiligo so in the top 50 terms itself we can more or less get an overview of what this uh, a psychological aspect of this disease is about sometimes it is possible that you may not get informative graph like this even in the top 50 terms so then you have to increase the number of terms and uh, try to populate them into this graph and uh, then try to make a overall sense of what is the uh, importance in this particular Uh, classified category of vitiligo then the next uh, case comes for pathogenesis so in the pathogenesis obviously we can see pathogenesis vitiligo as usual is at the top the biggest uh, word here pathogenesis involves the following terms such as oxidative uh, skin melanocytes autoimmune and the patients anyway will be there because if there is disease it will be patients dermatology and uh, there is a melanocyte and there are other words like expression and so on and so forth now if you want to know how these different words are connected to each other then we have to use the coherence function as we saw before and try to obtain how the specific instance in which they are connected which is actually the specific data for explaining their 
relationship with one another. So in the next slide, we now look at the drugs part. So in the drugs part, we can see that the treatment and drugs are more or less of the same size as they appear to go together. But then we see words like now repigmentation appearing. This we did not see in pathogenesis top 50. We also did not see in the psychology top 50. We are seeing in the drugs and treatment top 50. That is probably because repigmentation is a focus in treatment and drugs category. It is not a focus in pathogenesis and in psychology. Although it would appear that they would also be in some way related. But it doesn't come in the top 50. Then there are other aspects such as cutaneous, topical. We saw about this little bit in the uh, previous slides that uh, topical treatment are there. Then psoriasis is another disease which seems to be connected. This connection is also coming in the top 50 in the drugs uh, classified uh, part. It did not come in the psychology, did not come in the uh, pathogenesis. So this way, in each uh, classified part, you will see the how the focus and the importance is coming different between the different classified parts. So this helps us to understand how the disease has been studied in the different categories. In the same way, I'm assuming you would do for COVID as well. Okay, now here we have another example of uh, treatment. So in the case of treatment, ironically, we see that the drugs word does not come, but there are other words are there. Vitiligo in patients are, of course, the biggest word. The other words such as repigmentation, <coughs> the autoimmune, then there is phototherapy which is coming. So phototherapy was uh, not there or laser was not there in the other uh, classified parts. So this is there in this part, which actually tries to tell us that these are one of the important areas in the treatment classified corpus. Now, I want to move to a, a different tool, uh, not tool, actually it is a method called Global Vectors for Word Representation. This is a NLP based or natural language processing based algorithms developed in Stanford University and they have given it for free. We can use it. And let us see how we can use it and how it will help us in trying to obtain insights into the disease and various features of it. So why we want to know that? Because in order to develop any treatment methods or to do any discoveries of the uh, chemicals or compounds that would help in uh, go forward to become a drug for the disease, we must understand the disease itself. That is also important. So this, all this work basically tries to focus towards that area. So what is GLOW? GLOW is an unsupervised learning algorithm for obtaining vector representations of words where the training is performed on aggregated global word-word co-occurrence statistics from a corpus and the resulting representations showcase interesting linear substructures of the word vector space. So we already explained to you what is co-occurrence. That is the two entities of interest having a particular biological meaning 
are connected in the same sentence. That is called co-occurrence. The same co-occurrence concept is used by Glow in order to get word representation through a mathematical approach. The previous approach that I showed you was regular expression based approach. Now we are going to use a mathematical approach and I'm not going into the details of the maths here because that is beyond the scope of this lecture. So here what I discuss is how we are applying that in order to obtain useful insights into the disease we want to focus on. So given a glow vector, one of the applications as is mentioned in their website is to calculate what is called a cosine similarity. Okay, here you can see cosine similarity between two word vectors. It provides an effective method for measuring the linguistic or semantic similarity of the corresponding words. Meaning that there are some words are different. You know thesaurus and many other uh, uh, ways by which we can get different words representation having similarity in meaning. They may not be identical, but there may be a lot of similarity between them. Sometimes similarity can also come because of the connected concepts, because they are involved in the same concept also. So for instance, uh, enzyme kinetics and chemical kinetics. So the kinetics word is common to both enzymes and chemistry. Okay. So it is connected to enzyme and it is connected to chemistry, but that does not mean that kinetic means chemistry or kinetic means enzyme. No, kinetic means the rate of change of a given uh, reaction. So that is connected to enzyme because enzyme is a catalyst and that is also connected to chemistry because chemists are, uh, it's part of their uh, subject to study kinetics of reactions. So these are not same meaning, but they will have some, they are having context similarity. So sometimes words with context similarity can also be captured by this type of method. So this is what is being essentially shown in the figure here. You can see different types of frogs, like the first, uh, the third one is uh, Litoria, the fourth is a Leptodactylidae, and they all look like frog in some sense. I mean, they all—they are not really frogs. Each one is slightly different, but there is some similarity in their uh, morphology. I mean, they—they they would have some similarity. This kind of similar, although they are individual entities, they are individual species. They are different species, no doubt about that. But they are still close neighbors because of their biological features that we can see. And this closeness can be obtained through this type of cosine similarity calculations between word vectors from the corpus. So this is one way by which we can use GLOW. Then we can also use GLOW as uh, described in their website, that how you can get the relationships. For instance, the connectivity between man and woman, uncle and aunt, uh, they are parallel structures, okay? Un uncle will be a man and aunt will be a woman. Then king will be a man and queen is a woman. So sir is a man and madam is a woman. So man and woman, so this way these are parallel structures. So 
These are called linear substructures within the corpus, and these also can be obtained through certain computations from the word vectors. It's simple actually, it's not a very big computation. So once we get the word vector, the differences between word vectors are used in order to generate these, uh, rep uh, these uh, linear substructures. So this way what will happen is, whatever terms that we are not knowing about, their connection to another term will become apparent through this method. And once that becomes apparent, then we can go forward in trying to investigate more deeper to obtain insights that we would not have otherwise obtained. Now here is an example which goes in a little bit mathematical flavor as to how GLOW actually works. I mean, how it is making the word represent word vectors. So here it is mentioned here that GLOW learns word vectors such that their dot product, dot product is in, in uh, uh, mathematics, it is uh, in the vector algebra, it is uh, described. So their dot product equals the logarithm of the words probability of co-occurrence. That is, when two words are going to occur together, what is their probability? That is calculated. And the vectors which are generated, they are generated in such that their dot product will equal this probability. So that is the algorithm which the GLOW authors have prepared. And here is an example they show where how this concept is uh, is coming to be uh, coming apparent. So we can see here that the probability of an item given another item is something when it is given. For example, probability of a solid, K is equal to solid, probability of a solid given ice is the such a given eyes happens to be 1.9 into 10 power minus 4 from some word corpus it is estimated it is calculated and the probability of a gas given eyes is much lower it is 6 into 10 power minus 5 so that's about uh, 10 times lower compared to this that's because ice is a solid and uh, uh, gas is not a solid. So then comes water where we can see that it is actually a little bit higher. It is higher in the sense that it is 10 times higher that water given ice is about 3 into 10 power minus 3. So water is the uh, state, uh, physical state of the matter which actually which connects to the ice solid then let us uh, then they are showing the probability of a item given steam so a solid given steam is 10 power minus 5 some uh, one number into 10 power minus 5 which is 10 times lower than the uh, solid given ice uh, because solid and steam they don't go together then gas and steam, they might go together. So here it is a little higher compared to this case and uh, also a little higher compared to this case. So it is uh, uh, gas with steam. When it comes to water, again it is 10 times higher, which is water connecting to steam. So now if you calculate the ratio as they have shown here, the probability of solid given ice and probability of gas given steam, that is gas and steam occurring together and solid and ice occurring together, you just take the ratio of that, then here you get a ratio of 8.9. That is the 
probability of a word solid occurring with ice and the probability of a gas occurring with steam is much higher compared to the other cross terms. So this is how the word co-occurrence, it actually can be inferred from the corpus. Whereas in the case of water, we don't see any great preference. It's only about one point, it's about 1.36, very close to one. And uh, another word which is fashion, which is unrelated word with respect to these physical states of the matter for water is again one, close to one. So why this is uh, like that? This is like that because water is a very common word and it co-occurs with steam and ice almost equally well. And that is also because water is the liquid form from ice and water is also liquid form uh, for steam. So for both cases, it occurs in a, in a frequency in such a way that it is connected to both the states of the matter equally well. Whereas the extreme states, that is the solid to the gas state, are connected in a different way. So this type of structural uh, characteristics can be obtained through the word vectors representation. Now we apply this to the vitiligo corpus. Uh, yeah, sorry, we apply this to the vitiligo corpus and uh, we can see that the, some of the words which are generated are like this. So the word representation for vitiligo, it comes like this as, a, as numbers of 50 numbers. That's the option I took, which is 50. You can change from 50 to 300. Uh, 50 is the default parameter, so I did not change it. And uh, here again, patient for patient, this is the patient vector and so on. So each word is now represented by some numbers, which is very different from the word itself in the sense that the way we understand numbers is different. But for the uh, particular, as per the particular algorithm, these numbers are specific to this each word and they are connected. Now, how do we do this? So we go through the pre-processing steps of the vitiligo corpus using Python NLTK tools and libraries to remove common words, numbers, other characters, stop words and so on and also run a bigram bi program. <coughs> Sorry. Create words, vectors, which are numbers calculated from the model. So that's what I showed you in the previous slide. Then calculate cosine similarities between words, vectors. This is what I'm going to show you and what they mean and how we can use that to obtain insights into the vitiligo literature. Arrange in descending order of cosine similarity scores and assess the significance. So that is just a way of ordering so that we give some priority to what we want to look at. So in the next slide, I am showing here a graph where I calculate the cosine similarities of all the words in the vitiligo corpus uh, with the vitiligo word vector. So after doing that, I obtain some words along with their similarity scores, which is plotted here on the y-axis, cosine similarity scores. On the x-axis is plotted the frequencies of the same words as appearing in the corpus. So what do we see here? We see that a word called patient, it is appearing at very high frequency in the corpus and at the same time it is having very high cosine similarity to the word vitiligo. 
does that does that mean vitiligo and patient are same no it means that vitiligo and patient word they are connected to each other strongly patient is about a human being vitiligo is about a disease affecting a human being now we look at the graph a little more inside we can see some terms we see a term called non segmental we see a term called depigmentation we also see terms like skin and we also see terms like other information so when we want to learn in the corpus this is a list of words which has been prepared by glow without any filtering i did not use any filter that give me only disease words or give me only genes or give me only chemical compounds i did not use any filter i first wanted to see how these words come which ones are coming and what are the top scoring words so non segmental seems to be a top scoring word but look at its frequency of a, its frequency is very low in the corpus what does this mean this means that this word non segmental is very strongly connected to this word vitiligo wherever it appears wherever it appears it is strongly connected to the word vitiligo but its frequency of occurrence in the corpus is very low means there are not many papers which describe this word too many but if there are any papers that describe this word then it is connected to this vitiligo word strongly in the same way more or less is the word depigmentation and in the case of the words treatment and disease they are at a much higher frequency meaning that there are many more papers we also saw that we also got that indication from the when we did the classification itself and uh, no wonder that these uh, words are having higher frequencies and are also they are having pretty decent similarity scores about more than 0.6 by to the word vitiligo so to give you an idea of uh, how the score range is the score ranges from 0 to 1 and here for plotting purposes i have plotted those which are above 0.5 just to zoom what are the words are there if, if we want to plot all the points between 0 and 1 then it will become very crowded and sometimes uh, there may be loss of clarity so we can zoom some parts and look at those parts which are of importance in this disease so about vitiligo is a disease that causes loss of skin color in patches the discolored areas usually get bigger with time the condition can affect the skin on any part of the body normally the color of hair and skin is determined by melanin vitiligo occurs when cells that produce melanin die or stop functioning so vitiligo affects people of all skin types means it's there throughout the world the condition is not life threatening or contagious means it will not be passed on from one person to another but it can be stressful or make you feel bad about yourself this is the psychological part treatment for vitiligo may restore color to the affected skin but it doesn't prevent continued loss of skin color or a recurrence means you can give short term treatments uh, to help in the process but permanent cure for this disease is not available now we look at the word depigmentation de which was there in the graph so when we look at that and we look at vitiligo and ask the question okay what is de, how the depigmentation word is connected to vitiligo we see that depigmentation is actually a therapy so depigmentation therapy refers to medical treatments that remove skin pigmentation 
causing contact leukoderma. Depigmentation therapy is used in someone that has widespread but incomplete vit vitiligo. So there is one drug which is approved by FDA and uh, the commonly used agent is monobenzyl ether, ether of hydroquinone. It's uh, also, <coughs> also called as benzone. If the patient cannot tolerate it, then other therapies should be considered. So meaning that wherever pigments are there, those pigment will also be removed and the person will completely depigment their uh, skin. That is one way to, uh, by which uh, people accept the treatment uh, for vitiligo. After that, there is uh, very little hope to get back the pigment. So that is like a permanent uh, decision that some people take. We also saw the word non-segmental in the graph. So how it is connected to vitiligo? It is strongly connected to vitiligo and uh, we can see why. Because it is the most common type of vitiligo and it is thought to be an autoimmune condition. So in autoimmune conditions, the immune system does not work properly. Instead of attacking foreign cells such as viruses, the immune system attacks body's healthy cells and tissues, which is one of the reason why we get non-segmental vitiligo. And basically what does the immune system do? It destroys the melanocyte skin cells that make melanin. And due to which, what happens, why the immune system is doing that, we don't, we don't know. That is not fully known yet. Why it happens only in some people, again, we don't know. So there are some of these questions, as soon as you look at the insights you obtain through this uh, computational method, immediately, this type of questions arise in your mind and some of those questions then become your lifelong pursuit of research and career. Now, if you look at the Medline Plus uh, website, okay, what are the treatments for vitiligo? Let us search that. So I'm going to Medline Plus website. I'm not doing any computational work now. I am searching for the treatments for vitiligo. And what do I find? I find something called micropigmentation is mentioned. And that is shown here along with its uh, details. And then there is also the mention of certain journal articles like ruxolitinib and uh, tofacitinib and so on. Okay, these are also mentioned in the uh, Medline uh, site. You can see here the Medline uh, term is mentioned. Now, if I ask the question using the GLOW corpus and then calculate the cosine similarity, and this is because I'm having this cosine similarity calculation function in R. So I'm doing this in R. <coughs> you can do it in Python also. Not a big deal. So what we can see here is that treatment connecting to micropigmentation, it is only 0.12 is the score, very low score. Even though it is mentioned in the Medline Plus website, still the cosine similarity score comes to be very low. Why? We don't know. Let us look at it. Then we again run from treatment word vector and ruxolitinib word vector. And we ask the cosine similarity. Again, the uh, similarity value is very low. So if the similarity value is very low, that means the connection is also very low. Tofacitinib, uh, it is much better compared to at least two times better than uh, ruxolitinib and uh, slightly more than three times better than micropigmentation. So clearly, we can infer from this observation that for treatment, 
these three concepts of uh, treatment like micropigmentation, ruxolitinib or tofacitinib is not going to work. I mean, it's not working. It's not being used. Then why it is present on the website? We don't know. So let's look at in more detail. So we go at to another website, which is called WebMD. So in WebMD, regarding diagnosis and treatment for vitiligo, what do they mention? They mention that you can use corticosteroid creams. They haven't mentioned micropigmentation. And uh, they are also saying that you can try repigmenting the white skin using light therapy. So, mentioned in, uh, in the headline web page. Okay. So, WebMD is 2019 uh, reviewed uh, uh, by an MD doctor is uh, mentioning light therapy and also corticosteroid. Uh, not any of those which are mentioned in the Medline Plus. And we saw that in our computational um, uh, calculations also, we found that both micropigmentation and uh, this ruxolitinib and tofacitinib were low in uh, cosine similarity score with the word vector treatment, meaning that they are not connected strongly, meaning that questioning that are they being used in treatment at all? So now comes to the same graph, like for vitiligo, what we drew. We now draw it for treatment word vector. And let us see which words are here are coming effective. We do not see any particular treatment method coming at the top of this course. So we at the top scores are therapy and uh, treat and so on. These are mostly some kind of synonyms only. So synonyms also are coming in this uh, uh, cosine similarity score calculation. We can recognize that. Uh, we don't see a strong connection to vitiligo either. And uh, because the score is lower compared to other scores, and that is because many of the abstracts, they discuss treatment method very specifically. Uh, they may not even mention, or they may mention only passing uh, vitiligo just once or twice, but rest of the time, they might be talking more about the treatment and therapy only. This is uh, well known in uh, human communication. It happens. So, if we look at now in the treatment category, leaving out the top words, which are mostly synonyms, then what we see is phototherapy comes at the top with 0.66 cosine similarity score. And then comes NB-UVB, which is uh, abbreviation of some, uh, looks like an abbreviation of some therapy. We'll see in, uh, in the subsequent slides. There is a strong association with lesion. As a word successful. Uh, that might be because of the way uh, the investigators or authors are qualifying certain treatment, like adding some adjectives. Then eczema laser, topical tacrolimus, PUA, then systemic corticosteroid, again tacrolimus, NBUAB phototherapy, which is basically a synonym of this NBUAB, and pimecrolimus. So these are the top level of therapies uh, that are coming strongly connected to the word vector treatment. Not any of those words which were mentioned in Medline Plus, but phototherapy and these therapies and uh, uh, corticosteroid was mentioned in the WebMD. So <clears throat> WebMD appears to give a more accurate picture of what is uh, happening in the literature, current literature with respect to vitiligo. 
This is one uh, new uh, information as well uh, as we go along in this uh, text mining process. Now, I ask the question that what are the strong words that are strongly connected to phototherapy? We see narrow band UVB is uh, is coming. Narrow band ultraviolet therapy, UVB, narrow band UVB, and so on. And then corticosteroid also is coming, strongly connected to it. And narrow band, so these are mostly synonyms to each other. And with respect to vitiligo, the score is low. And one reason is, as I had mentioned before as well, that while discussing therapy, they discuss only therapy and uh, related uh, aspects of different therapies, pros and cons of them. And vitiligo may be mentioned only uh, in the passing. So that is one reason why this score is uh, coming low. Uh, that does not mean that uh, it is not connected. It is also connected. Now, if we go to the word vector narrowband UVB and ask the question to which uh, uh, word vectors is this having strong similarity? So, mostly they are synonyms that is, narrowband ultraviolet, narrowband ultraviolet, and phototherapy was anyway there before also. Then, uh, corticosteroid was there before also. So, nothing new is coming with respect to the top scoring similarity words. As we go deep, uh, scroll down the list, then we now see some new words appearing, such as military, YAG laser, melanocyte, keratinocyte, immunogenicity, pembrolizumab, delivery, and so on. So now some new words are appearing at lower score, of course. So what do what do these connections mean? Melanocyte, keratinocyte. Let's look at that example. And we see that in the next slide that there is a mention is there about clinical trials have indicated that narrow band UVB is a therapeutic option for vitiligo as it increases the growth and migration of melanocytes and induces the expression of keratinocytic and melanocytic cytokines associated with repigmentation. So clearly mentioning that the narrow band UVB uh, therapy option or for in the phototherapy option is uh, very useful for the vitiligo patients and uh, it also it helps in the repigmentation meaning wherever pigments are lost their pigments will come back and pigmentation will come back and that helps to uh, treat the disease. Then as you scroll down further and further, we see certain other words are also coming, such as single flash, TH1, bulb, and so on. We don't want to know more about this bulb and flash and so on, because our focus is on the disease aspect. But bulb and flash and so on can be the focus of a particular therapeutic center. That is what type of light they want to buy uh, and so on. So it all depends on what is the focus. And based on the focus, we want to uh, search for those words which are related and guiding us in our mission. So we see immunomodulation is uh, one word that is coming. And uh, if we now uh, go deeper and search uh, from the literature, we find that the well-documented immunomodulating effects of UV radiation can explain the stabilizing of the local and systemic abnormal immune responses, thereby stabilizing depigmentation. So the major molecular target for how this happens, so how the UV therapy works, we are able to obtain some insight into this. So the way it works is it uh, 
<clears throat> it targets the nuclear DNA with absorption by nucleotides leading to induction of various DNA photo products. Now, this can be damaging actually, notably pyrimidine dimers. Once this happens, then certain immunosuppressive effects including IL-10, uh, natural killer cell activity, they start uh, getting activated. And because of that, the immuno response, it changes. And once it changes, then it helps in repigmentation. So basically, for some reason, the immune system, which has gone in an autoimmune mode of attacking uh, the cells, the pigment forming cells in uh, vitiligo, that is now being reversed due to this type of effects. Naturally, when it is doing damage to DNA, then people have concern that whether it might cause cancer or whether it might cause any other side effect. So, <clears throat> the UVB is a range of UV which is around 300 nanometer or so and NBUV means narrow band, meaning a very narrow band of wavelengths in the UVB category, not the entire UVB <coughs> category. It's a kind of soft UV, which is actually is uh, used, but it is harder than UVA. So <clears throat> the UVB, uh, narrow band UVB, it has this effect of temporarily producing this uh, DNA uh, products. through this uh, UV, uh, NBUVB uh, phototherapy. We also saw what is called uh, a word called eczema laser. So let's look at eczema laser and to which words it is connected. So we can see the word lamp, NBUVB we already know, monotherapy, then xenon chloride, uh, that may be something to uh, deal with the laser uh, because it's an inert gas. Then Hello? Yes, sir. We are able to hear. Hello? 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 Hello. Sir, you able to hear? Hello. 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 You are able to hear from your side. You are able to hear? Yes. Okay, I am continuing, I am continuing. Okay.
okay sorry about that so <coughs> we then uh, try to now look at what is uh, topical tacrolimus and then we get the words it's an ointment uh, to which it is uh, strongly connected calcipotrine so you can see that the most relevant or uh, useful word only comes as strongly connected ointment did not appear in eczema laser but it is appearing in tropical tacrolimus at the top high score so that's because it's an ointment no doubt uh, and uh, calcipotrine then uh, nbuvb we have already seen eczema laser we have already seen so what is this medication tacrolimus is an ointment used to treat the symptoms of eczema a skin disease that causes the skin to be dry and itchy and to sometimes develop red scaly rashes in patients who cannot use other uh, medications for their conditions so how it works it works by stopping the immune system from producing substances that may cause eczema so it is a kind of a immuno suppression ointment on the skin and uh, as we go lower down we can see many other words which are appearing but at a lower connective strength and uh, with vitiligo of course it is low uh, <coughs> because uh, it may be one of the options which is being used to treat vitiligo it may not be the topmost option so so far we have seen the uh, kind of therapies which are targeted in the case of vitiligo and they are called untargeted uh, therapies untargeted means they are not specific to any given gene they are they are uh, they are attacking the system no doubt but they are not specific to a particular gene uh, as an activator or as an inhibitor now if we want to do targeted therapy then we have to look at the genes which are involved in the vitiligo disease process so if we do that then we can see here is a plot of the genes and their uh, frequencies of occurrence uh, you can see that tyrosinase is the most important gene occurring in this uh, vitiligo process then there are other genes are there uh, cd4 and cd8 and also catalase many other genes are there but their um, their uh, frequencies are much lower compared to these genes so now let us look at the literature and see uh, how good. to how these are connected to vitiligo and how this can help us in giving insights into targeted therapies so first let us uh, calculate the cosine similarity of the uh, of the tyrosinase word vector mm -hmm. and we can see that the terms uh, that are coming at high score first is that it is a protein and no doubt it's a protein and it's an enzyme also uh, then uh, there are other uh, words which are coming at high frequency is expression but its score is not very high the uh, other words like auto antigen enzyme melanomart they are coming with high score but with low frequency meaning that wherever they appear they are very strongly connected to the word uh, tyrosinase and the other words are like reactivity assay and so on and this important term is now coming here in this disease which is called the melanogenesis which we never saw uh, in these graphs with any other words it is coming only with the word it's coming with the word tyrosinase now let's go to the co-occurrence function of pubmed minor and ask the connections between the enzyme and the disease so here we can see that this connection it explains how tyrosinase is an enzyme important in melanin formation is a principal autoantigen of autoimmune vitiligo 
So it clearly gives us the main role of tyrosinase and therefore how important it is in the disease of vitiligo. Patients with depigmentation disorder vitiligo lack the capacity to synthesize melanins from L-tyrosine via the essential activity of tyrosinase. So, a little bit of the steps of the pathway of melanin is also mentioned here, which also leads us to search for the melanin pathway synthesis, the biochemical pathway synthesis uh, from here. And then we can also see that somebody has identified uh, a derivative uh, uh, of uh, uh, which is a, f a compound which actually is a potent tyrosinase activator with better activity and lower toxicity than the positive control which happens to be 8-methoxysoralane. So, 8-methoxysoralane is a compound which has been identified also in the treatment of uh, vitiligo, but uh, somehow it's not very popular. Uh, so, phototherapy is more popular. Uh, so, this is how we can see that, how we can identify this compound and then now uh, as chemists, you can uh, search for many other analogs which may have similar or more potent activity and which may be even drug-like in order to develop new drugs against uh, vitiligo. Then in the next slide, we see a few other examples such as uh, this compound, which is uh, short form is MPFC, which is another derivative of Chromen 2 on a solar solarlen derivative, and uh, it is also identified as more effective tyrosinase and melanin activator than the positive control 8 MOP in consideration of low doses. So, when the concentration of each, uh, so these are the different uh, uh, relationships we can get with respect to the enzyme tyrosinase and uh, the other uh, uh, functions such as activator or inhibitor with respect to this gene. Then we can also see that there are other medicinal herbs and many other compounds uh, uh, which have uh, inhibition effects whereas uh, compounds like Bayer, Congelacin and Bergap-10 had activating effects. So, these uh, tell us that what are the compounds that can be now searched for with respect to the targeted therapy. So, going in the lines of uh, towards the mission of targeted therapy, we can also find that there are um, there is a compound called methyl 3 5 dicafeoyl quinate, which actually is uh, helping in upregulation of the expression of tyrosinase uh, enzyme. Then uh, there is another uh, enzyme uh, which is called, uh, which is called calizerin which increase tyrosinase activity and melanin, con mel melanin content. Uh, that is also helping uh, in this uh, towards, uh, these discoveries help towards finding new, therap uh, new therapeutics in a targeted fashion. Maclurin treatment is another, uh, uh, these are treatment means these are uh, laboratory, laboratory treatment of the cell lines. B16 is a cell line, which is a murine cell line uh, on which these uh, works are done. A murine skin skin cell line on which all these works have been done. So the, the treatment word occurs there also. Uh, patients also treatment word occurs there also. So some words occur in two different contexts. That's what I have been telling. Like kinetics, chemical kinetics, enzyme kinetics. The uh, maclurin treatment has been discovered, which also is going to be helpful uh, for the 
uh, uh, towards uh, considering for development of targeted therapies. Now, let us look at the uh, CD4 and CD8 positive cells because that was also coming very dominant in the uh, uh, word cloud plot of the genes which are important in, the, in, in vitiligo. So what we see here is that CD4 T cell dependent autoimmunity against a melanocyte new antigen induces spontaneous vitiligo and depends on fast fast ligand interaction. So what happens is the CD4 T cells and CD8 T cells which are normally immune cells for our defense purpose suddenly becomes part of the attacking autoimmune system in vitiligo. So, uh, the T cells are more commonly present in vitiligo's patient's skin and remaining in lesion site, which is composed of CD8 and CD4 T cells. So, how that happens, we have no idea. What was the trigger which did this? due to which patient, uh, people are uh, undergoing this kind of uh, immune response. This is not clear. But what is becoming clear is that these cells are involved in this, in this process. So here is another uh, evidence where it says that mechanistic studies in mouse models of vitiligo and alopecia have specifically implicated an interferon gamma driven immune response uh, and cytotoxic CD8 T cells as the main drivers of disease pathogenesis. So the same cytokines and the same uh, immune T cells which are very important part and inherent part of our body defense system has now become part of it has now become attacking our own pigment cells. Something has gone wrong, no doubt, due to which this kind of uh, malfunction in the immune system has happened. What is the trigger? How it happens? Probably we don't know. There may be many more studies required in order to reveal these uh, processes. However, there are ways to overcome these difficulties also. And what are the ways? So finally, we come to the disease model after all this literature mining and such that the immune system in the process of vitiligo, there is some malfunction has happened and it affects the melanin pathway. And that is why vitiligo is happening. So this is the connection between the two and that we have seen that how the melanocytes are being affected by the immune cells, in fact killed, they are killed by the immune system due to which this happens. So what are the ways by which we can identify cures? One way is to down the immune system which is called the immunosuppression uh, by corticosteroids or immunomodulation like phototherapy. Okay, through these methods, we can do this. The other method is activators. So you activate the melanin pathway, which is being attacked with the immune system, but you keep activating it stronger and stronger to overcome the uh, attack from the immune system. Then what now people are thinking is to combine both sides of the therapies and use what is called combination therapy in order to approach the vitiligo disease. So this way you can use the text mining in order to come to very specifics and detail and build an overall model of the disease and its cure and then identify which target and which molecule and how to go about the uh, therapeutic uh, aspects and how to go about drug discovery in the case of any disease. So I would uh, like to end with this uh, Swanson's ABC principle. So Swanson actually in 1986, he presented a principle 
called ABC principle. So essentially what it means is that there is, he used the case like this of Raynaud's disease. So Raynaud's disease is a blood viscosity. It relates to blood viscosity. So he finds that there is abnormal in uh, abnormal viscosity in blood of some patients with Raynaud's disease, uh, such as blood viscosity is rising. Then he found that fish oil can reduce blood viscosity in other literatures. But there was no literature which proved the relationship between fish oil and Raynaud's disease. So he made a hypothesis that fish oil can cure Raynaud's disease. So after that, this hypothesis was proved by clinical trials and thereby the ABC principle was uh, proved. So uh, in the same way, what I want to suggest is that whatever uh, other studies are there, not vitiligo, but wherever the immune system is malfunctioning, there what drugs people are using or what are the methods people are using for treatment uh, in the cell culture also. You can connect them if there are similarities between that process and the immune system malfunction in vitiligo, you can connect the two and thereby apply Swanson's principle in order to discover new possibilities of therapies. This is how new drug discoveries could be made. Final slide, I want to say that we can see how text mining can help us in revealing the disease model, the entities involved and their importance and how we can move towards new drug discoveries. Thank you. And I am ending here. Thank you. Uh, sir, you were able to hear? Hello.